Good afternoon. My name is Kent Mormon, and I am the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as Dr. Cog TAC. I call to order the February 22nd, 2021 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. As a reminder, for the agenda items and questions and comments, please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you are also unmuted on your end. Please state who you are and represent, and then proceed speaking. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. At this time, Cam will list all TAC members and attendees. If for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. Cam? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance, I currently see Al Allenwash, Alex Hyde Wright, Andrea LaRue, Andy Taylor, Art Griffith, Ben Pierce, Bill Soros, Brad Calvert, Brad, uh, Brad Calvert, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, Carson Priest, Chris Chauvin, Chris Hudson, Danny Herman, David Gaspers, David Vara, Deborah Basket, Emily Lindsay, Eugene Howard, Frank Bruno, James Eusen, Jane Rao, Jeff Dakenbring, Jessica Fernco, Justin Begley, Kelly Heaton, Kevin Ash, Lisa Nguyen, Mac Kelson, Maria De Andrea, Marissa Gaugan, Matt Marshall, Ma Matthew Helfant, Melissa Balding, Michael Romero, Mike Whitaker, Phil Greenwald, Richard Pilgrim, Robert Spots, Sangu Lee, Stephen Strominger, Steve Dran, and Thomas Reef. And that is all the attendees I currently see right now, Mr. Chair. And now I also see Todd Cottrell, William Haas, and Thomas uh, Schumer, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Again, if you um, did not hear your name, please uh, email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added to the record. We are saying goodbye today to Eileen Yatsu from Denver and David Kretzinger from CDOT. We have a new member for the non-RTD Transit Spatial Interest Seat, Frank Bruno, CEO of VIA Mobility. We have a new alternate for the RAC, uh, Jessica Furco. And then uh, Boulder County has slightly changed roles between their members and their alternates. Alex Hyde Wright of Boulder County is the new member he was the former alternate. And Megan Davis of Louisville is now the alternate. She was the former member. We will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing, pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which time you will be asked to wrap up your uh, comments and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussions regarding each agenda item. Cam, please unmute all participants at this time.
Okay, Mr. Chair, they have been unmuted. Hey, Cam, um, are there any raised hands? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me give it a moment. I do not see any at this time. Anyone on the phone that would like to make a comment? Hearing none, uh, Cam, if you would again mute everybody so that um, we can continue on with our meeting. Yes, Mr. Chair, they have been muted. Okay, thank you. Is there any discussion or questions on about the January 25th, 2021 uh, TAC meeting summary? If so, please raise your hand to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Um, please make sure that you're also unmuted on your end. Cam, are there any hands raised at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am not seeing any hands raised at this moment. Thank you. Uh, if if not, the um, tax summary uh, meeting summary stands approved as, as as submitted. Thank you. At this time, we'll be moving into our action items. Um, first, we will um, so we'll now um, have Ron Papsdorf uh, give a. Uh, presentation on the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvement Program, Safer Main Streets. Ron? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me just pull up this presentation real quick. Glad to be here today and glad to be joined by Rebecca White, the Director of the v Division of Transportation Development at CDOT. Let me see. Mr. Chair, can you see the presentation show? Yes, it's, it's uh, not a full screen on there, but I can see the show. Yes. Oh, I'm fine. Well. No, you're, you're fine. You're fine. You're seeing just the slide one, yes? Yes, just the slide. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, um, glad to be here. Um, we are happy to return back to TAC uh, just by way of background and reminder. The um, Safer Main Streets program is a joint venture between CDOT and Dr. Cog. We have $77 million available to allocate to projects focused on reducing fatal and serious injury crashes, accommodating uh, safely all modes of travel, improving transit access and multimodal mobility, uh, supporting the development of connected urban and employment centers and multimodal corridors around the region, providing safe access for residents of the region and helping communities adjust to new travel patterns caused by COVID-19. Um, so a lot of goals for this program. Uh, we opened a project solicitation back in July through August 14th of um, 2020. We received 46 applications that requested a total of $123 million in grant funds. Uh, reminder, the grant funds are a combination of state and federal funds administered both, uh, some by Dr. Cog and most by CDOT. Uh, on December 16th of 2020, Dr. Cog board awarded $58.9 million for full or partial funding to 30 projects located in nine different jurisdictions across the region. Um, as part of that allocation, CDOT and Dr. Cog agreed to pursue a phase, what we call phase 1.5, um, to work with 
uh, partially successful and unsuccessful applications from that first solicitation to try to address questions or concerns that the selection panel uh, for the program had um, to give an opportunity for those project sponsors to provide additional information or clarity around their requests and basically resubmit for reconsideration um, either additional funding or um, uh, funding for projects that were not initially successful in that first round. Uh, we have now completed that process um, with CDOT and are bringing, and just by, sorry, by uh, reference here, the round one award summary, again, leaving about $18 million of remaining funds to be allocated. Um, we went through that solicitation process, and if Rebecca's ready, I'm going to hand off with to her to walk through that process and get to the recommendations that we have before you today. Thanks, Ron. I'm here and ready. Okay, so uh, picking up the baton here, um, the, the phase 1.5 process we went through had a, a few different steps in it. Uh, it started with uh, sort of an invitation to every uh, applicant to uh, meet with CDOT and Dr. Cog and, and provide us additional information, ask questions, so essentially hold a meeting with us. Of the um, eight uh, communities that were sort of in this bucket of being eligible for phase 1.5, seven took us up on that. Um, so we had a, a good set of discussions and then that led to a, um, a form that we sent out that asked a series of follow-up questions, just sort of eliciting more information around particular elements of the projects. And once we got all that information back, we went through uh, that same process you are all pretty familiar with now with our scoring and selection panel to just look again at uh, the eight resubmittals. If you go to the next slide, please. So here were the eight communities um, that were uh, invited to resubmit. Um, and you can see here the, the specific projects. Well, I guess there are seven communities because there were two Denver projects. But you can see them all listed here from the um, request from Broomfield, City of Broomfield, City and County for the full funding of the 112 Uptown Complete Streets. Two requests from the City of Denver, uh, one to fund the Evans Avenue Zero Safety Project. Uh, and then a request to fully fund the Broadway Corridor Project. Douglas County resubmitted for the C-470 trail um, grade separation. City of Littleton for full funding for the Mineral Station East Mobility Shed Improvement Project. City of Parker requests to fund a project along Parker Road, State Highway 83, that included a sidewalk and, and various improvements. RTD had put in a request to fund a, kind of a whole slew of ADA projects in the metro area and provided a, a lot more further detail on those in their second submission. And then the City of Superior um, resubmitted for the McCaslin Boulevard, uh, Indiana roundabout. So the result of that process, I believe, is on the next slide. And, um, and you can see here that as a result of 1.5, we are re, um, proposing to reallocate about just shy of $17 million of that $18 million that was uh, left available after round one. And the sort of funding amounts are broken down here. And if you could go to the next slide. So this is, is the motion. I don't know, Ron, if, if you want to convey this and or if we want to take questions at this point. Um, I, I think either way, I will just note here that we did, um, at the um, at CDOT's request, we there is uh, just a substitute motion that was in the packet. It just adds um, to authorize kind of the administrative modification of the transportation improvement program so that we can get these, once these projects are awarded by the RTC and the board, that we can wrap them directly into the TIP to kind of expedite the process. That's the only change. Thank you. So with that, Mr. Chair, happy to take questions. Okay, are there any questions uh, from the TAC or the alternates for Rebecca or Ron? If so, please raise your hand and Cam, let us know. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, I do see a hand raised from Alex Hyde Wright. Uh, Alex, you've been unmuted, so when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, could you flip back to slide six of the presentation really quickly? Um, so I noticed of all of the project applicants that submitted requests for funding in around 1.5, it looks like all of them received funding except for the superior project, um, the McCaslin and Indiana roundabout. And their amount requested is 1.2 million and the amount left over at the end of all this is 1.3 million. And their benefit cost ratio, while on the low end, is higher than some of the projects that did receive funding. And so I was wondering if either CDOT or Dr. Cog staff could address um, why the superior project is not proposed to receive any funding in the round 1.5. Sure, I'm fair question. I'm I'm happy to um, answer that, but would look to my uh, partners in this effort to fill in as well. You know, we um, spent a lot of time with each of these subsequent applications. I would say for the superior application, the real difficulty was finding uh, a clear safety nexus there. There was no history of accidents at this location. Um, the project large, largely appeared to be geared towards um, just providing a, a faster egress from a, a neighborhood there so that it's cars instead of having to um, wait to, uh, for a break in traffic would enter a roundabout. So we just couldn't find uh, the case to be made there. Um, unfortunately, didn't did not have the chance to talk with the, the city further. They weren't available for follow-up discussions, but in reading their materials, there just was not a toehold that we could uh, make a case that this was a project that really fit with this application in particular. Okay, thank, thank you for the explanation. Um, and then a kind of follow-up question to that, uh, what happens to the 1.3 million that is left over from the round 1.5 now? Also a good question. So right now CDOT is, um, we're looking at two ideas. Um, I'll list them in kind of priority order. So one is that we would take this kind of 1.3 million, as you mentioned, and wrap it into what we expect is a continuation of this program at the statewide level. So right now there is a, a bill that's been introduced at the state legislature that would provide 30 million dollars statewide for um, a, a safer Main Streets and revitalized Main Streets, kind of a, a combination of two programs we have now, one focused a lot on economic recovery from COVID for communities and the other on safety. Uh, the legislature as part of the stimulus funding would like to provide 30 million for that. It looks like that, um, that request has a high likelihood of success. And if it does, we would take this 1.3 million and roll it into that. We would, uh, we are looking at a equity distribution for that 30 million. So we would make sure that as part of that, this 1.3 million stayed in the Dr. Cog area. And that should be pretty easy to do. So that's option one. Option two, if the, uh, if the legislation doesn't come through, I think CDOT would look to just, um, reinvest these dollars into a, a safety project in the Denver metro area. And we would be happy to report back to Dr. Cog on the selection for that. But I don't know that we have one in mind right now, because I think first we'd like to see if the legislation moves forward. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Any other hands raised, Cam? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I do see a hand raised from Phil Greenwald. Uh, Phil, you're unmuted now, so uh, please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Thank you uh, for letting me speak. Uh, Phil Greenwald from Longmont. Um, thanks again, too, for putting this together, the round 1.5 award amount and those different issues. And, and thanks for explaining the superior piece as I had the similar question as Alex. Just wondering if that 1.3 couldn't be rolled into these other uh, projects that didn't receive their full funding, uh, if there's any possibility of of that, or if that's already been uh, that subject's been broached. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd ask the other committee members to help me here, but I think we've already done that, right? Every every partially funded project we already reevaluated for full funding, correct? 
Yeah, and this is this is this is Ron or Rebecca. That's correct. The the selection panel. This this is the recommendation that came out of the selection panel. We're all we're all really comfortable with that. For other than that superior project, all of these project sponsors that requested the additional money for round 1.5 got the amount that they requested in that round. Great, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Are there any other questions or hands raised, Cam? No, Mr. Chair, uh, not at this time. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Brian Weimer just raised his hand, uh, if ahead, that's Brian. okay. Yes, Brian, go ahead. Yes, this is Brian Weimer from Rappo County. Um, I move to recommend the regional to the Regional Transportation Committee the award of $16.8 million in change to seven projects from the Safer Main Street program as presented and administratively modify the transportation improvement program. Thank you, Brian. Uh, do we have a second? Cam, is anyone raised their Mr. hand? Mr. Chair, I, I see a hand raised from uh, Phil Greenwald. Uh, Phil, please go ahead. I would second that motion. Okay, thank you, Phil. So we have a, a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? Please raise your hand. Cam, any hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, I do not see any. Okay. Then at this time, we'll proceed with voting. Uh, Cam, if you'll unmute, unmute the, the TAC members and alternates representing the members only for a verbal vote. Uh, yes, in, Mr. Chair, they've been unmuted. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. Any abstentions? Motion <laughs> passes unanimously. At this time, we'll move on to the informational briefings, as that was our only action item. Uh, the first informational briefing will be on fiscal year 22, fiscal year 23, community mobility planning implementation, the MPI set aside eligibility. Um, and I believe Derek Webb is making that presentation. Derek, when you're ready. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me and see my screen. Just wanna make sure. Yes, we can. Okay, all right, I'll jump into it. So uh, this is the FY 2022-2023 Community Mobility Planning and Implementation set aside. Uh, my name is Derek Webb. Uh, I'm a planner here at, at Dr. Cog. Um, I really just want to run you through um, kind of a recap. Uh, this presentation is really focused on a recap and uh, of the program um, and some minor updates that we've um, put together for the eligibility rules and selection process. Um, uh, but first, um, many of you will recall this: uh, the inaugural uh, kind of cycle uh, of this set aside uh, happened. Uh, last cycle, the FY2020-2021 uh, funding cycle, and I just wanted to run through and provide some uh, kind of quick highlights for that. Whoop. Not sure what happened. There we go. All right. So um, during the last cycle, uh, during the, the letter of intent phase, we did receive 44 letters of intent from 19 sponsors throughout the region. Uh, the breakdown between um, the, the types of, of in letters of intent were uh, 22 small infrastructure and 22 planning. Um, during the application phase, so between the LOI phase and moving into the application phase, all of those 19 sponsors were invited to, to apply uh, based on, on conversations we had at the, during the LOI phase. Uh, ultimately, we received 33 applications from 17 sponsors. Um, the breakdown there was 19 small infrastructure and 14 for planning. Um, and then as we move to the approval phase or the, you know, the recommendation from the project selection committee up to the board of directors um, approving uh, that recommendation um, it ultimately ended in 16 funded projects um, the breakdown there was 10 small infrastructure and six um, for planning 
Um, but uh, based on that, um, we have kind of updated our, the, the program focus um, uh, and, and have uh, made some minor minor updates to the, the eligibility rules and, and selection criteria process. Um, so just to just to, to highlight um, the program purpose and goals, um, the, the purpose itself of the of the set aside is to support planning and small infrastructure projects that contribute to the implementation of key outcomes within Metrovision and the Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, program goals you see listed here um, should look uh, relatively familiar. They they uh, specifically come out of uh, Metrovision. Um, they are the the outcomes and whatnot um, that we felt really specifically spoke to um, the goals that that uh, really align with the purpose of this of this program. Um, with that, there is one uh, new one that we added. Um, really, just made sense to to include it. Not sure why we didn't uh, include it last uh, cycle, but um, that is to support a transportation system that is safe, reliable, and well-maintained uh, since we are focused on, on, on this link. So um, in terms of new things, um, we have added um, some priority emphasis areas. If you've looked at uh, what was included in the, the agenda and the packet um, for this meeting today, um, you'll notice in that eligibility rules and selection um, process document, the draft uh, version that's in, included in that packet. Um, this, this section has been added to that document. Um, and it's, it's, um, it, it really links um, some of the more recent uh, planning activities uh, that is, have occurred uh, with uh, relation to the, the active transportation plan and the Vision Zero, regional Vision Zero plan. Um, so, but they also um, also specifically uh, link to the regional transportation planning priorities that are included in the draft um, MBRTP, um, the, the 2050 Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so also trying to, to link specifically to those, um, those planning priorities as well. Um, so I do wanna point out that projects uh, in this cycle, projects that address one or more priority emphasis area are likely to be more competitive during this round of funding. And as such, um, during the, the scoring, um, and selection process, um, those projects that do um, uh, address one or more of these areas will receive extra additional points during that, um, that review. So those emphasis areas are planning for or implementing active transportation, planning for or implementing safety, and uh, planning for improvements in transit supportive land use along uh, regional bus rapid transit corridors that are identified in the, the 2050 MVRTP. Uh, just to recap here, funding availability and requirements. Um, so uh, the, the set aside itself is, is broken into two different pots, basically. Uh, you've got the planning side and the small infrastructure. So 1 million in the planning side for this upcoming cycle and 1.4 um, in the small infrastructure side. Um, you know, we always say that totals are subject to change. You know, funding could be returned from, from the previous uh, cycle um, and what have you. Applicants may request funding for up to two years. So uh, that should actually say 2022 to 2023. I apologize for that typo. Um, there are two additions uh, to the funding availability is that we have added project minimums. Um, so for a planning project, $75,000 is the, 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 the minimum amount of federal funds um, that will be uh, eligible for, for request. Um, and for the small infrastructure side of things, uh, $100,000 is, is um, that um, minimum threshold. Um, again, this, this upcoming cycle, we are proposing no funding maximums. Again, it worked uh, very well uh, to work with project sponsors last cycle um, and to see uh, you know, what they've identified as, as, an, as a true uh, funding um, need uh, versus um, you know, in the past with other set-asides, we've seen uh, when there has been a maximum uh, listed that uh, typically a lot of project sponsors just request the maximum. So um, it was helpful in the last cycle and, and we heard good things uh, in feedback. So we uh, we were continuing on with that recommendation. Um, and then, you know, like other uh, set asides uh, the, and, and the use of federal funds, there is a, a local cash match required that's 17.21% of the total project cost, whereas the federal share is 82.79%. Uh, sponsor eligibility has not has not changed. Um, for planning projects, uh, non-governmental organizations must emphasize the connection between planning outcomes and the implementation of projects by governmental partners, partner agencies. So planning projects are open to those non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, what have you in the, in the region. Uh, for small uh, infrastructure projects, only local government, CDOT, RTD, and other governmental agencies are eligible project sponsors. So unlike the planning projects, um, Nonprofits and transportation man management associations, organizations, what have you, um, are not eligible uh, for the small infrastructure side of stuff. Um, 
again, you know, must be in good standing with the state of Colorado via the Secretary of State Business Database. All scopes must adhere to the federal SDBG program guidance and the project sponsors must pledge local matching funds, which I just mentioned. Um, we do list uh, some planning examples or, or eligible project types uh, on that eligibility rules and selection process document. Um, just to get given an idea of, of the types of projects that, that uh, could work for this set aside. Um, under planning examples, um, those do include, uh, you know, projects that involve multi-jurisdictional coordination and regional collaboration, you know, things like site assessments uh, to determine feasibility of projects, you know, TOD development projects, first mi last mile strategy development, um, that type of thing. Uh, we've also included local vision zero or safety related plans as a, as a link back up to uh, that focus on, on safety in the priority emphasis areas that we've included this round. Uh, in terms of small infrastructure, again, nothing really changed here. Uh, really focused on bicycle and ped facilities, micromobility, supportive infrastructure, safety enhancements, traffic calming, all those types of projects. Um, and then uh, again, for, for just a recap, last cycle, we did introduce a two-step application process, which I've, I've kind of alluded to already in this presentation, but um, that starts off with a letter of intent and then feeds into an application. Uh, the full application process really starts with a uh, CMPI application workshop, um, which we are aiming for the end of April, right after uh, the board hopefully approves uh, this eligibility uh, rules and selection process document. Um, that will kind of coincide with the, uh, uh, the call for letters of intent. Um, step two is to identify the project concept and begin early discussions with Dr. Cog's staff. Um, that's kind of a nice to have, um, you know, uh, project sponsors aren't required to do that, uh, but they can if they wanna kind of bounce a couple ideas off of us before they uh, formally submit a letter of intent. Uh, after letters of intent are submitted, uh, we set up meetings with those project sponsors to discuss um, those, uh, those proposed projects, um, and then applicants are invited to apply. Again, last uh, cycle, we did not turn anybody away. Everybody that submitted a, uh, an LOI was, um, uh, was invited to, to apply. Um, after uh, applicants are invited to apply, they submit their application. We work through the project scoring uh, and review uh, process. And then we uh, you know, work through the recommendation from the project selection committee um, up to the Dr. Cock committees and the board of directors. Um, and then once uh, determination and approval has been made, um, applicants are notified uh, about their approved projects and um, the work begins to get under contract with CDOT. Um, just to review the application review process, um, we established an in internal project review panel um, for scoring and evaluation of the projects. The panel will include staff from both the Transportation Planning and Operations Division and the Regional Planning and Development Division. It may also include staff from uh, other Dr. Cog divisions like the Communications and Marketing or the Way to Go team, uh, the Area Agency on Aging, and uh, the Executive Office. Uh, basically, each member of the panel will review and, uh, the applications and assign points uh, individually um, based on you know, the information contained in the application. Uh, the panel will convene together to discuss those applications and, and discuss, you know, the points that, that have been assigned and come to a final consensus on the total score for each project. And then that panel will uh, develop a, a recommendation list um, uh, for the projects to be funded by the set aside. And those again are taken through the Dr. Cog committees for review and final approval by the board of directors. As for next steps, uh, so, you know, the, this is kind of an info item since we were changing up the um, the eligibility rules and selection process documents slightly by adding those priority emphasis areas and then those other minor uh, updates that I, I mentioned in this presentation. We did want to just uh, give you guys a, a heads up uh, before coming to you again next month, um, or I guess technically in April, um, for um, uh, for recommendation up to, to, R, to RTC. Um, but as for this, this tentative timeline, so this month we did also host a CMPI webinar um, I believe in your packet, it, it says application workshop. It wasn't an application workshop, that's a typo, I apologize for that. It was really just kind of a teaser, teaser webinar to get it out there to, to give um, potentially interested sponsors a, a heads up that this is coming up and, and um, much like the information you just received, uh, that, that's pretty much what was, was contained in that webinar and allowed sponsors to ask some initial questions about what we're expecting, what, what the process was like and that type of thing. So again, um, next month or, or again in April, uh, we'll come back to you guys. Um, based on any feedback we received here today, 
um, or, or uh, any other updates um, necessary, we'll come back to you in April for um, that recommendation up to RTC. Um, in April, uh, hope to have RTC and the Board of Directors um, um, take a, make a motion um, on these or take action on, on the eligibility rules and selection process document. At that same time, I, I mentioned a mandatory application workshop at the end of April. Um, in May, we will release the uh, call for letters of intent and schedule those letter of intent discussion meetings with project sponsors. Uh, then in June, uh, the call for projects will be released. Uh, July, we will spend the time um, internally working with the project selection um, team to um, evaluate those applications and uh, complete the scoring and, and developing our recommendation. Then August, we'll be back uh, to present those recommendations to you, uh, the, the TAC, and then uh, move into September with the RTC and the Board of Directors for those funding recommendations as well, uh, hoping to have that um, ready to go uh, for October 1st when uh, FY 2022 starts. So that is pretty much where we're at. Um, I'm happy to take any questions anybody may have um, or any feedback. Thank you, Derek. Sure. Um, are, are there any uh, questions for Derek? If so, please raise your hand. Cam, do we have uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I do see a hand has been raised by Justin uh, Bagley. Uh, Justin, you're now unmuted. So when you're ready, uh, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, Justin Bagley, City County of Denver. Um, thanks, Derek, for the overview. Um, we were definitely um, following this and, uh, you know, as a participant in CMPI from the last cycle, we learned a lot. Um, can I can I have you pull up slide five by chance? I just have a question about that third bullet because I think you said it's new. Um, yeah. Particularly on that that item says planning for um, improvements in transit supportive land use. So I think the transit supportive land use is pretty straightforward. Um, what can you? I know you had some examples, but would improvements along bus rapid transit corridors include? you know, early stage planning for operations or something like that? Or do you have other examples for that? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't have anything specific. Um, you know, the transit supportive land use side is, is probably geared more toward the planning um, and potentially, you know, code updates, that type of thing that would need to, to occur. On the improvement side, I think we're thinking anything small infrastructure-esque. Um, and again, you know, the, the the cost associated with those could balloon quickly, uh, I would imagine. So, um, I, you know, it's I, I think it would definitely be a good idea to have an early conversation about at an LOI stage or or even before that, if you wanted to, um, if there's something that you had in mind. Um, I don't have a specific uh, example um, I could give you at the, at this point. Okay, thank you. Are there any other hands raised, Cam? Uh, yes, Ms. Mr. Chair. The next hand I saw was from Alex Hyde Wright. Uh, Alex, you're unmuted, so uh, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. This is Alex Hyde Wright with Fulver County. Um, thank you, Derek, for the presentation. It's uh, super helpful. Sure. Um, I think the, the proposed scoring and the evaluation criteria look fantastic. My only regret is that we don't have more funding for this program. Yeah. Um, I had a, a couple questions. Um, on one of the slides about the requirements for the small infrastructure projects, there's a stipulation that bike and ped projects have to be not purely recreational. And I was wondering, is this a federal requirement or is this a requirement from Dr. Cog? And I was just noting the inconsistency between prescribing mode purpose bike and ped projects, which we don't really ever seem to talk about with car or highway projects. So when, and then also wondering how um, mode purpose would be evaluated um, for the small infrastructure projects. Um, again, good, great question. Um, where are you seeing the mode uh, call out? Was that in the actual uh, draft document? It was in your presentation. Um, could you go forward one slide? Your planning projects. There, that first bullet point. 
uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities that are not exclusively recreational. Now, this is a carryover from uh, the, the eligibility rules and, and selection process document from last cycle. Um, you know, I, I think it's definitely a, a good point to make. Um, hey, Derek, this is Ron. Sure. Ron Papsdorf here. Alex, thanks. I, this is this is related to the funding source for the program, which is federal CMAC funds. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right which are not eligible to be eligible to be used on exclusively recreational facilities. Okay. And then I guess my follow-up question to that is how will the, um, how will that be evaluated um, with the applications? I think it's, it's up to the project applicant to demonstrate that it is not an exclusively recreational project. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then one final question on one of the earlier slides, it said that this uh, program contains a required 17.21% local mesh. This is more of a detailed question, but are we going with that 17.21 or the standard Dr. Cog 20% to make the numbers easier? Uh, we went with 17.21 last cycle. I think that was just um, just the guidance and, and in early conversations with CDOT, the, the way that we chose to, to go. Um, I'm, I'm Ron, correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't realize that there was a, a standard Dr. Cog 20%, um, open to, to that feedback and can make that change if, you know, pleases the, the committee. Apparently, apparently, um, Boulder County wants to allocate more local dollars towards these projects. <laughs> I wasn't alloc I wasn't advocating for that. I was just going to clarify if it's going to be changed later <laughs> and that, um, I guess I was... Not advocating for either point, but just wanting to confirm that this would indeed have the 17.21 and not the usual 20. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And that was all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Alex. Are there any other hands raised, Kim? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I see a hand is raised from Brian Weimer. Uh, Brian, you're unmuted, so uh, go ahead when you're ready. Thanks, Derek, and thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, since this is the second go around, what lessons learned uh, with this program um, did you see from the uh, first go around, and has it been successful in terms of implementation and meeting its goals? Um, sure, so uh, I have a couple answers. Um, the based on feedback that we've received after the process you know uh, project selection process and whatnot and, and ultimate um funding uh, approval by the board last cycle um you know the sponsors that had applied and received funding even those that didn't receive funding um thought that the the letter of intent uh phase uh, you know the, the two-step uh phase that we that we implemented this for the set aside worked really well um, they felt like a lot of the feedback that they were able to to gain from those early conversations at the LOI phase uh, really helped in uh, in 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 helping them prioritize uh, what they spent their time working on a full application on. Um, there were a few other takeaways, um, you, you know, uh, contracting um, after after award um, has has proven difficult and 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 will 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 always be a uh, kind of drawn out process. You know, it's just, just how it works. Um, CDOT administers these funds and, and getting under contract for all of these different types of projects um, um, took a while. Um, and then throwing in the pandemic, um, I, I would say that not every project sponsor is where they want to be based on uh, the intricacies that that kind of injected into uh, contracting and, and kickoff meetings and all that type of thing. We'll say all of the pro, uh, planning projects from last cycle are under contract, but the 2020 projects that that um, uh, needed to kick off um, during during the 2020 FY 2020, not all of them were able to, um, based you know based on again the, the pandemic and and trying to figure all that stuff out. Um, some other uh, takeaways, uh, I would say. Um, some of the small infrastructure projects uh, ran into some issues um with you know doing their environmentals really getting a very clear budget um put together based on engineering um and whatnot so th there are a few projects that are struggling a little bit with the funding that they received based on um based on their initial assumptions 
um, and then turning around and actually coming down uh, with you know the actual hard costs to, to implement the projects are being a little bit a um, little bit uh, higher. Um, so this go around, we're definitely going to have those early conversations to see how how really rooted in in actual numbers um, those those project costs are, um, and just warn warn project sponsors as they're as they're coming through with these types of, of um, proposals that they could run into these issues or, or um, try to steer them into in in different directions if we do see that uh, that some of these issues could come up. Um, but overall, it's, it, it really feels like the, the set aside um, um, last cycle uh, worked out really well and, and projects are, are actually really gearing up right now um, to, to, to move forward. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Are there any other hands raised, Cam? No, uh, no, Mr. Chair, not at this time. Thank you, Derek. And Thank you, Ron, for the clarification on the funding um, on the trails. At this time, we'll uh, move on to our next informational briefing, and it's uh, I-70 Floyd Hill to Veterans Memorial Tunnels uh, Improvement Study, and I believe Steve Cooks now lead this off uh, from Dr. Cog. Steve? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, every once in a while, probably be three or four times a year, uh, for the TAC, we like to present uh, major studies that are going on around the area, uh, NEPA studies, EAs, EISs, things like that, just to give you an update on some of the major uh, projects that are being looked at uh, around the region. And so today we're going to have uh, Vanessa Henderson, who is the Re CDOT Region 1 Environmental Manager, uh, give you an update on the I-70 Floyd Hill to Veterans Memorial Tunnels project. So I'll turn it over to Vanessa. Thanks, Steve. Can you guys hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Steve, for the update. And thanks, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to present to the Dr. Cobb Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, as Steve says, we're just going to give you an overview of the Floyd Hill project, where we stand, and all of that information. I'm also going to um, have Neil Ogden present with me. So he is the resident engineer for the project, and he'll be um, taking over in the mid middle of the uh, presentation. And as Steve said, I'm the Region 1 Environmental Manager, and I'm also um, managing the Floyd Hill environmental project. So. Um, I'm sure all of you probably know where Floyd Hill is uh, located. However, I wanted to make sure you know the limits of the project. So we're looking at um, the project going from about mile post 248, which is just east of the Beaverbrook Floyd Hill um, interchange, which is the eastern part of the interchange at the top of Floyd Hill. Um, it then extends west down to mile post 241, which is the first easternmost Idaho Springs Colorado Boulevard exit. So we're going down Floyd Hill um, through what you guys I'm sure all know is a very steep grade and around some very tight corners um, and then through the Veterans Memorial Tunnels. Um, I-70 is the backbone of um, travel and commerce and is really the primary east-west route through Colorado. So this is heavily traveled and it needs a lot of help. I'm sure all of you have sat in congestion um, on the weekends trying to get up to go skiing or camping or anything else. So this is the primary route that connects Denver metro area to the mountain communities. So um, the purpose of the project, I've kind of already talked about a couple of them, but we're looking at improving travel time, reliability, safety, and mobility. As you know, uh, the highway up there drops from three lanes to two lanes going westbound, which really limits the capacity in the high volume area. This affects not only um, the regional mobility on I-70, but also local mobility um, for the residences at the top of Floyd Hill. The, when the highway is backed up, people like to get off the highway at that Beaverbrook exit and take US-40 down to try to avoid the traffic. 
that then clogs up all of the uh, community streets up there at the top of Floyd Hill and residents, residents aren't able to get into their homes and they can sit in that congestion for an hour just to get home. Um, this congestion also creates unreliable travel times and frequent delays. You don't know what time you're gonna be able to get to your destination because it's just so unpredictable. Um, and this also creates safety concerns because of you know, the substandard geometry I was talking about with the steep grades and the tight curves. So the project needs to look at improving um, all of those conditions. We're also looking at um, addressing the deficient infrastructure in that corridor. So the westbound bridge at the bottom of Floyd Hill is nearing the end of its useful lifespan and it needs to be replaced. So this project's gonna make sure that we take care of that deficient infrastructure. In addition, there's another bridge, the uh, off ramp from westbound I-70 to US-6. That bridge is also um, eligible to be replaced. So we'll also address that bridge. In addition, the infrastructure for bicyclists and pedestrians is insufficient between Idaho Springs and US-6. So we're gonna improve that multimodal connectivity through that area. There's currently a Greenway Trail through there. However, um, it's not up to the standards that Clear Creek County and the users would like. So we'll make sure that that's improved. And lastly, we need to uh, make sure there's an alternate route for emergencies or severe weather. So I'm sure all of you know how many times the highway will get closed and you really can't, you can't get off the highway and take a really quick detour. So um, this, this just helps um, in the congestion, mobility and accessibility problems. And so we need to look at those. Emergency responders aren't able to actually get to where they need to go when the highway is so congested. This is true for the residences at the top of Floyd Hill, as well as any crashes on the highway itself. So we're looking at incorporating an alternate route to address um, all of these issues. Here's an overview of the major features that are gonna be included with this project, no matter what we do. So these are gonna go towards helping us meet the, the purposes on the previous slide. So westbound I-70 will be reconstructed and we'll add a third lane there so that we don't have that three lane to two lane decrease right at the top of that really steep hill. We'll be replacing those two bridge enterprise eligible bridges that I mentioned, the one at the bottom of Floyd Hill and also the one on the off ramp to US-6. We'll be looking at flattening the curves and improving safety throughout westbound and eastbound I-70 from the top of Floyd Hill to Veterans Memorial Tunnels. We'll be looking at doing some interchange and intersection improvements throughout that project area. Um, that bottom picture on the right is actually a roundabout um, at at the top of Floyd Hill at the Homestead interchange. Um, we're looking at putting those roundabouts in at both of those interchanges up there um, to help with the flow for the residences as well as the US 40 traffic and I-70 traffic. Um, we'll also be looking at different interchange improvements that um, Neil will talk about in a little bit. As I mentioned, we'll be also looking at the Greenway and improving the Greenway for bicyclists and pedestrians and other recreational and commuter users. Um, we'll be looking at adding a frontage road between Central City Parkway and US-6. Um, that will help address that alternate route that we need to include. And we'll also be looking at wildlife safety mitigation improvements. So we'll be including some wildlife crossings and fencing in the project. Um, the wildlife crossings, will likely not be part of the actual main project. We're looking at some areas outside the project where it'll benefit the wildlife um, more than it would benefit them in the project. But we will also be improving all crossing locations under bridges and everything like that so that the wildlife will be able to cross safely. Um, and then lastly, we are going to be adding an eastbound I-70 climbing lane for heavy commercial or slow moving vehicles. Um, this, we will be adding an on-ramp from US-6 onto eastbound I-70, which currently does not exist. And to help with the slow moving uh, trucks that will be getting on at that um, exit, we're adding that climbing lane so that they can get up to speed to get up the hill. And that's um, a graphical representation up there of what that portion of I-70 will look like in the future with three lanes going westbound, three lanes going eastbound, plus that climbing lane. And then that's also showing the off-ramp for US-6 going westbound. 
I am going to turn it over to Neil now, and he's going to start discussing the status of the project and the overview of our alternative moving forward. All right. Well, thanks, Vanessa, and, and thanks everyone for having us here today. Um, appreciate the the time to provide this update. Uh, so again, my name is Neil Ogden. I'm with uh, CDOT. I'm the resident engineer and project manager for the Floyd Hill project. Um, so just in terms of overview and status, we started this environmental work and preliminary design uh, in 2017. Uh, we've looked at uh, numerous alternatives, uh, but ended up advancing two through the environmental assessment process. Um, the Canyon Viaduct, as you see here, which is emerging as the preferred alternative, as well as a tunnel alternative with two design options that we did look at. Um, we did evaluate a no action alternative, which included just the bridge replacement at the bottom of the hill uh, in the event we weren't able to address uh, the rest of the project um, for comparison purposes. So in terms of status, we are looking to wrap up our environmental work uh, this spring and get that environmental assessment out. Uh, we've got our preliminary design done enough to evaluate these impacts that we've been looking at. Uh, we do have an estimated cost for both the alternatives, uh, total project cost of 700 million. And so that includes, you know, preliminary engineering, construction, construction engineering, everything required to get either one of these alternatives done. We're looking at innovative delivery on a project of this magnitude. Um, and so we've decided to use constru the construction manager, general contractor delivery or CMGC as it's, as it's known in industry, uh, which really encourages innovation, reduces risk, and ends up uh, delivering successful projects uh, for CDOT. Uh, throughout the process, we have had a really great stakeholder and, and public support, and uh, we've engaged both local and regional stakeholders um, through our the I-70 corridor context-sensitive solutions process, uh, just to make sure that we're getting all the, the comments and concerns addressed. All right, next slide, Vanessa. So the we do have the next few slides. We're going to walk through the alternative just so everyone understands what this looks like uh, using visualizations we've created for uh, various public engagement events and meetings, etc. As well as highlight some of the key components of the project. So what you're looking at here is we're at the base of Floyd Hill looking to the east. And as Vanessa mentioned, we're um, flattening the horizontal curves, improving the safety coming down the hill. Uh, we are shifting and optimizing this alignment uh, to the right on your street screen, really using as much of that highway footprint, existing highway footprint as possible. Um, you can see the additional capacity in the westbound direction um, that would start essentially at the top of Floyd Hill where the current bottleneck exists and go all the way through the project limits and tie to uh, the Veterans Memorial Tunnel uh, where the westbound uh, Mountain Express Lane is planned to open this summer. And as Matt also mentioned, we are adding that um, additional eastbound climbing lane uh, up Floyd Hill to help with that with heavy moving or commercial vehicles uh, and improve operations going up that hill. So this visual is looking the other direction in the same location. And so what you see here are the eastbound and westbound viaducts um, wrapping around in between the two existing mountains or rock cuts. Um, this is where the bridge enterprise eligible structure gets replaced the, on westbound I-70, as well as the replacement uh, for the westbound off-ramp, as you can see on the bottom right of your screen. You also see here the eastbound on-ramp uh, that we're adding to this interchange. 
as well as the westbound on-ramp where we're relocating the existing left-hand on-ramp to the current proposed right-hand on-ramp um, to improve operation safety to the, to the more standard uh, interchange configuration. And the last piece here to highlight is the extension of that frontage road uh, to the west, as you can see it going under the viaduct, um, extending all the way to the next interchange over, which is Central City, providing that redundant connection uh, we've been talking about. So moving on to the west, this is a visual of the eastbound and westbound viaducts um, climbing from the bottom of Floyd Hill, uh, traversing from the north side of Clear Creek to the south side and landing on the, the mountainside to the south of Clear Creek. What this does is it opens up the existing highway foot, footprint to extend that frontage road, um, reclaim some of that existing area next to the creek and uh, provide potential recreational and other opportunities through this section of the corridor. It also provides opportunities to really uh, construct this offline, minimizing impacts to the traveling public you know, during construction. Continuing to the west here, you see the, the eastbound and westbound viaduct coming down from that, that knob we saw in the previous rendering, the extension of the frontage road towards the, the hidden or the, the central city um, interchange, as well as the greenway that we will be improving uh, throughout the, this section of the project. And this is the last, last rendering we have. Um, so looking from Central City to the Veterans Memorial Tunnel, we are optimizing this alignment by uh, flattening these curves, um, widening slightly to the south, realigning a portion of the creek and the frontage road to accommodate, these wi accommodate the widening um, and really minimizing the, the rock cuts on the north side. Uh, so we can build this under traffic and minimize uh, the impacts to the, the traveling public, public during construction. So this is uh, just a summary of the, the overall project benefits. Obviously, you know, safety is number one on this. We're, we're flattening curves. We're improving our sight distance. Uh, the congestion relief in itself is, is a substantial safety improvement. Uh, we talked about uh, getting rid of that, that historic bottleneck that has been around forever, um, getting people on the highway uh, to reduce that congestion to the local communities on top of the hill, uh, taking care of those bridges and the, the aging uh, deficient infrastructure that's out there, and then providing that continuous capacity all the way from, from the Denver Metro uh, to the mountain communities up through Clear Creek County and to Empire Junction, where we lose about 25% of our traffic going up uh, towards Winter Park. Um, we, all, we do have elements of the project that reduce the annual vehicle collisions. You know, Vanessa talked about the wildlife crossings that we're looking at implementing, as well as other strategies such as um, wildlife fencing and, and, and other things to, to mitigate some of those, those safety issues we're seeing. And then the big one is during uh, our peak, peak travel times, reducing that those travel times and providing, providing that reliable trip so that folks uh, know when they can arrive in these, in these communities, um, even during the peak travel times where we see the, the historic congestion. And so this is just a, a next step slide and, and what we're looking at in terms of strategy for delivering this project. Um, it, it's such a large project, we've broken it into uh, manageable pieces. And so we're looking at uh, delivering in two packages where the, the first package would be the, the westbound I-70, the bridge replacements, and then the interchange interchanges, really the, the lion's share of the work 
uh, followed by the eastbound I-70 uh, improvements as well as the frontage road. Um, but prior to that, looking at what what we can do with our existing uh, financial resources and, and get out uh, on the street to make improvements as soon as possible. And so we're looking at uh, the wildlife crossings, uh, some operational improvements uh, for the roundabouts to improve uh, operations and, and access to those local communities. Um, we have some local transit improvements along US 40 that we're looking at uh, getting out on the street as soon as possible, as well as some, some safety improvements in that west section where we could do some of that, that curve flattening um, prior to getting the, the rest of the project constructed. And then some enabling work uh, just for getting ready for the, the primary project and to accommodate future widening in the east section. Um, and then the last piece is as we're looking for this funding, we are we are working with uh, our bridge enterprise and our high performance transportation enterprise on a funding gap study to look how we can uh, close the funding gap and find the additional dollars needed uh, to get this important project out on the streets. And with that, um, if there are any questions, we can respond to those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and uh, I can call on you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I do see a hand has been raised by Phil Greenwald. So Phil, you're unmuted. Uh, when you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, this is Phil Greenwald from Longmont, Boulder County. Um, boy, I don't envy you guys in this project. I mean, if there's one stretch of roadway that everybody in, uh, pretty much in the front range knows about, it's this one. So uh, thank goodness you guys have taken this on as a task. Uh, congratulations, and, and I'm sorry. But um, just wanted to ask a little bit, when we talk about improving capacity or adding capacity, um, sometimes it seems to say that the westbound Mountain Express Lane will be a continuous capacity from Denver to Empire Junction or at US 40. But in some of the slides, it shows it as, or in, in some of the descriptions, it was as um, just additional, an additional lane or additional climbing lane. Um, how do we, how do we rectify that, or how how does that jive, or how does that go together with what we're saying about any additional capacity should probably be be managed for any project. I have a follow up as well. Yes, and so the, the preliminary recommendation is that this would be a managed lane. The operating um, characteristics of the lane are still to be determined, um, but really it's it's to provide that reliable trip, to provide that flexibility, to make sure that, you know, that we can manage um, that travel time uh, consistently throughout the corridor and in line with what we're doing elsewhere in the state. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's I also wanted to mention that um, so that mountain ex the mountain express lanes, both the eastbound and the westbound, those are only open as you know during peak periods, and so that's when you know Floyd Hill is congested as well. So those are going to help. They're not full time and they're not capacity. They're more operational improvements that were added, and those are. Um, currently scheduled um, to be available through 2030. Is it 2035, Neil? I don't know why I'm blanking on that all of a sudden, but, um, and then we have to reevaluate how to move forward, whether with a permanent project through there or um, continue the Mountain Express lanes. Great, thanks. And then I just, really quickly, I mean, again, I think I'm up there every few weeks it seems like and have noticed that recently there's been some issues with um, eastbound sun glare in the morning and they actually closed down that section of the highway you probably know this better than i do um, mm -hmm. to that eastbound traffic and, and you would think well that's not a big deal in the mornings but it really does impact the rest of the system obviously so i'm just wondering is, is there anything part of this project that's I mean, it's it's got to be just a few times per year, but is, is there anything that deals with that sun glare issue or is that something that can be mitigated? 
So you're exactly right. I mean, it is a few times a year and something that we have considered. Um, you know, obviously we, we cannot move the sun, but what we have done is we're working with our emergency response teams and our, our corridor management teams uh, to provide um, additional traveler information and staging areas along the frontage road that we would build um, so that it's it's much easier much easier managed uh, when those do when those incidents do occur. So no, good good question. It's something that we're definitely taking into into consideration as we as we move this thing forward. Great. Again, thanks for your time. Thank and you, Mr. Jill. Chair, I do see a hand raised from uh, Mr. Alex Hyde Wright. Uh, Alex, you're unmuted, so when you're ready, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, and I'll echo Phil's comments about this being one of the most high-profile and complicated projects you're likely to undertake. Um, I had another question about the peak period shoulder lanes or managed lanes. Um, my understanding that the existing eastbound peak period shoulder lane is not wide enough for the Bustang buses to be able to use it. And I was wondering, as CDOT extends these and builds additional managed lanes or peak period shoulder lanes on I-70, are the new lanes going to be wide enough to accommodate the transit buses that CDOT operates on the corridor? Yeah, so I, I can start the response, but Vanessa, please jump in. Um, so, so yes, this is this project would accommodate uh, any any size buses, any transit operations on the the eastbound peak period and westbound peak period or Mexel um, projects. Those are interim operational improvements under the the corridor record record of decision, and so those are narrower, and so um, our buses are not allowed. Uh, currently to, to operate in those lanes, but we are looking at, at smaller shuttle options uh, throughout the corridor on how we can improve transit, you know, in a, in a challenging and constrained environment. Vanessa, do you have anything else to add to that? No, that you covered it. Good question though. Um, one other question on the, the peak period shoulder lanes. It's my understanding that those are only op allowed to operate on a limited basis because at other times they essentially are the shoulder on um, the existing eastbound section. There's the two general purpose lanes and then a very minimal right side shoulder and then the 11 foot uh, peak period shoulder lane. The visualizations that you showed, each of the viaducts looks like they had essentially a five lane cross section. Uh, three lanes in each direction, and then a full width inside and outside shoulder. Is that to allow the future managed lanes to operate um, more than just during peak periods? Or I guess it. What what uh, the one thing that struck me is if the if those lanes are only intended to operate on a limited basis, then are we increasing the project cost by including full width inside shoulders as well as lanes that would only be open part time? And so, again, Vanessa, jump in. But so this is a, a 2040 project or an ultimate project in this corridor. And so we're designing it to full standards. Um, you know, that, that said, as we go into final design, this is something that we will refine. We'll take a deep dive and see how we can, you know, optimize this, this alignment, optimize the cost, and really minimize um, costs for a substantial viaduct structure uh, like that. So, so no, that, good question again. Thank you for the presentation and the follow-up. I'd just add to that that it's um, the cross section is currently the same cross section that's going through the Veterans Memorial Tunnels, um, because as Neil said, this is a permanent, you know, permanent improvement to that section of highway. Gotcha. Thank you. And thank you, Alex. Um, are there any more questions uh, for um, Vanessa or Neil? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, I do see a hand raised from Phil Greenwald. Uh, so Phil, you're unmuted. Uh, and when you're ready, go ahead. Sorry, just one more question I was thinking of as, as I watched your presentation. 
Uh, and this is Phil Greenwald from Longmont again. Um, so was the tunnel option removed due to cost or environmental or all of the above? And if that's the case, are we kind of done with doing kind of those major tunnels ever in the future from kind of CDOT's point of view? Because, uh, you know, it seems like we used to do them uh, quite regularly and uh, haven't seen any of those tunnel options really move forward in the past or in the, in the, mo in the recent past. Thanks. And so um, to start off, you know, cost was not a differentiator in terms of moving them through uh, the environmental process. Uh, that said, we looked at all impacts, um, life cycle cost, uh, geolog geologic hazards, uh, risk, uh, all sorts of different things that we that we look look at uh, through that NEPA process, and um, the Canyon Viaduct was what emerged. Um, out of this study. Yeah, definitely the tunnel um, alternative had more environmental impacts and um, it was not eliminated because there was nothing that would, you know, was a showstopper for the tunnel alternative. So it's not eliminated and part of the CMGC process that Neil uh, said we will be moving forward with um, is actually a time for the contractors to come in and give us more information and if they have a way to make the tunnel alternative be the better of the two alternatives, that is something that we can consider moving forward since it wasn't actually eliminated. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, other hands raised, Cam? No, Mr. Chair, I don't see any. Okay. Thank you. Um, just to comment on the full shoulders, um, our experience on I-25 is that those are really needed uh, as opposed to uh, smaller shoulders uh, just from a crash and uh, safety standpoint. So uh, I appreciate seeing those full shoulders, at least in the preliminary planning of that. Uh, if there's no further questions, uh, thank you, Vanessa and Neil, and uh, we'll move on to our next item. Um, which is federal transportation issues. And I think Ron, you're leading this off. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Pepsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning Operations at Dr. Cog. Um, few changes last fall. We had a big election. Uh, we have a new admi federal administration. Uh, the FAST Act um, uh, was extended and we're still waiting for a full reauthorization bill. We've got kind of changes to some big federal grant programs. Um, so we have invited Dr. Cog's contract uh, federal lobbyist, Mickey Farrell, to join us this afternoon and provide TAC sort of some perspectives on um, many of those changes uh, re relating to the new administration uh, and the start of a new congressional session with Democratic majorities in both the House and the Senate now, uh, key administrative, um, appointments and priorities around transportation and infrastructure and just um, kind of keep TAC um, up to speed on many of those changes and emerging issues in preparation for what will probably be a fairly active uh, 2021. Uh, with that, happy to introduce uh, Mickey Farrell. Um, Mickey, you should be able to unmute yourself and take it away. Um, can everybody hear me? I, I think I have figured out this technology thing. We got you. Uh, Excellent. Okay, so as Rob said, my name is uh, Mickey Farrell. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Cog's uh, federal lobbyist. Uh, on on uh, this call is also my business partner, Emily, um, but I'm going to be the one giving this presentation today. Uh, so hello, everybody. I know some of you uh, on here from uh, longstanding uh, history, uh, but just wanted to go through these four uh, points that Ron has asked uh, for a quick briefing for you all in uh, we will start with uh, the cabinet. So uh, Biden has seven cabinet uh, officials uh, already approved, uh, and then two other uh, folks that are uh, non-confirmable. They're just part of the president's structure. Uh, key uh, among which is uh, Mayor Pete was confirmed as the uh, Secretary of Transportation. So it's good news from a transportation standpoint is that the uh, Secretary of Transportation was one of the first uh, folks uh, confirmed. 
Uh, one of the key officials for uh, transportation is also the OMB uh, director. The, for those of you who know, the Office of Management and Budget is where everything financial uh, through the administration flows. Uh, the OMB director uh, nomination does appear to be in some trouble uh, on in the Senate, and we'll have to wait and see what the outcome of that is. But my guess is by the end of the week, they will be searching for a new nominee for the OMB uh, director uh, shift. Uh, so there are many um, outstanding uh, cabinet members, but many, uh, several of them should be uh, done in the next two weeks. There will be a handful that will will drag on a little bit. But uh, as for the cabinet, uh, they are making steady progress in uh, getting the Biden administration cabinet uh, stood up. So that sort of transitions into once the president has a cabinet, then they're able to sort of work on what the legislative priorities are for the new administration and. Every new administration um, has its uh, pickup in, in to start, but what you're seeing with a Biden administration because of uh, President Biden's um, extensive background with being the former vice president, but also being a United States senator is they came in with a robust set of policy items that they wanted to work on very quickly. Uh, first and foremost is uh, obviously COVID-19. Um, they introduced uh, in almost the first day was the American Rescue Plan, and I'll, I'll give a few highlights of that in a second, but I'll go up to kind of 30,000 feet. Uh, they also uh, have policy uh, priorities in the first year uh, around, uh, and these are straight from the White House's um, policy page, so I'm just going to read to you what they are. Uh, policies around uh, climate. Now that will likely involve transportation. We'll talk about that in the reauthorization bill in a little bit. Uh, racial equity issues around criminal justice reform, healthcare access, education, fair housing, and tribal sovereignty. Uh, the economy. Uh, economy is really kind of centered around the American Rescue Plan at first. Uh, healthcare, they want to expand uh, the Affordable Healthcare Act. Um, and also, uh, they have already sent one of the big priorities, immigration, uh, and they've taken several executive actions on immigration as well. They have a 100-day freeze on deportations. Uh, they ended the uh, stay in Mexico uh, program, and they sent the immigration proposal to Congress, and they want to tackle DACA with a pathway to citizenship in eight years. Um, the immigration form is what I would define as sweeping, uh, and it can be broken into many different uh, pieces, uh, but they'll have to uh, weigh that politically whether it's not whether or not it's better to go in one big package or break it apart and pack them into the pieces. So I want to actually refocus back a little bit on the American Rescue Plan because that is the one that you're hearing uh, on the news a, a lot. Uh, and it is the $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus bill. At a very high level, about half of that money uh, goes for family relief. That would be to pay for the uh, $1,400 uh, individual stimulus checks. Uh, that would be, uh, um, that's about $455 billion. About $400 billion would go to the $400 per week uh, unemployment benefit. And then there's some other things in, in that half of the bill, but a vast, vast majority of that bill is really on, on kind of those, or at least that section of the bill is on those two items. Uh, then there are uh, items for what we call COVID. Those are vaccine programs, uh, mitigation programs, uh, that type of stuff. So there's $70 billion for the distribution of, of vaccine and for more testing uh, across the country. There's $130 billion, uh, and that's on top of what was already passed uh, in the December bill uh, for uh, K through 12 schools. Uh, there's another $35 billion for higher education. And something that's new and was a priority in the campaign is $120 billion for paid emergency uh, family leave for people who have COVID related issues, they would be able to access the uh, Federal Paid Family Medical Leave Act and they would be able to collect uh, some sort of uh, uh, compensation uh, for their uh, paid family medical leave. 
Uh, and then the last section of the bill is what they call struggling communities. Um, the struggling communities have a, 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 about 75% of that section is the state and local funding. And I'll we'll talk about that in a second. There's a 20 uh, more billion dollars for mass transit, meaning RTD is going to get uh, another uh, transfer of funding. And uh, there are a bunch of programs for small businesses, including restaurants and other small businesses. They're actually revamping the Paycheck uh, Protection Program. Um, so they'll be doing a lot of um, enhancements to that. So just a high level coming back, a lot of people have asked questions about, well, what does it mean when there's $350 billion? What does that mean for Colorado or state and local government? Um, the way the House has written the bill is that 60% of that money would go to the governor, 40% would then go to cities and counties, and then it's split equally between counties and cities. So I'm going to kind of run through some high number, high level numbers. As it stands now, Colorado would receive around $5.7 billion, about $5.75 billion out of this $350 billion. This would come in a direct federal payment uh, to the state, and then it would be sub-allocated to uh, cities and counties on a, on a formula basis. What that means is 60% would stay with the governor. Uh, this would not be able to go to the legislature. This would be solely at the discretion of the governor, and that's for, uh, 3.42 uh, billion of the 5.7 billion. Counties um, would split 1.14 billion based off of population. And then cities would split the other 1.14 billion uh, based off of uh, a, a, a formula that directs most of it uh, to urban cities. They would get um, about 969 million, and that would be for cities over uh, 50,000 population. Now, this is all still in flux. This hasn't passed yet. And then non-urban cities, uh, basically rural cities, cities under uh, 50,000 population split 171 million. So again, that's just kind of a high level look. This isn't passed yet, but wanted to sort of give you what it sort of meant for Colorado uh, financially on the $350 billion. Uh, the next program uh, Ron sort of wanted uh, an update on is the grant program. I'm going to start with the one that they actually just released last week, and that's Infra. So last Wednesday, uh, they sent out a NOPA on Infra. Uh, it closes on March 19th. Uh, it is almost 900 million. It's 889 million. Uh, broken into uh, large projects and small projects. Large projects over 25 million. Small projects under 5 million at least 10% of the money has to go to smaller projects. 25% uh, of the total amount has to go to rural areas. Uh, and right in the NOFA or in the press release uh, that they sent out, they are looking for um, heavy local participation, meaning that they know they're going to get way more applications than they have money for. So that they're going to want a quote unquote complete funding package, meaning that you're going to have to demonstrate to be a successful application, you're going to have to demonstrate that there is a vast, vast majority of the funding already identified, and this, these dollars will be used to just complete funding packages. Um, the Biden administration has um, shifted into some new. Um, emphasis on how they're going to select these projects, and I'll just read to you uh, what they are. First is around climate change, um, and I'm just going to read it directly what it says. Um, climate change, or whether they support strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, such as deploying zero emission vehicles, um, infrastructure, or encouraging modal shift as a reduction in vehicle miles traveled. The second criteria that they're going to focus on in the application process is, is um, equity-focused community outreach and projects that are designed to benefit underserved communities. The department will also consider whether the project is located in a federally designated community development zone, including qualified opportunity zones, empowerment zones, promise zones, or choice neighborhoods. So for all those of you interested in infra grants, 
uh, you can go search, uh, you know, a US DOT infra grants. Uh, I, ironically, they do not have the application itself loaded yet. Uh, again, it just came out last week, but you can sort of get kind of a high level. Here's what they're looking for for, uh, for those types of projects. The other grant area that is typical uh, every year is the build grant. Uh, they announced uh, a, a while ago that they were actually delaying build. The Trump administration late, uh, late uh, in its, its final year, uh, kind of announced a whole new set of things they were gonna um, judge build grants off of. They um, canceled uh, all of those and have delayed that program to April 26th. So they'll be focusing on infra first, getting those applications, and then build will follow out later uh, in April. Uh, so you can keep your uh, eyes out for, for that one. And finally, um, what does all this mean as we look at what we, what most of us all care about is the transportation uh, programs. And one of the things that is um, critical in passing a, um, a infrastructure bill will be the ability of uh, Congress to be able to get a bill through uh, the United States Senate. The United States Senate has very tough uh, budget rules. And uh, unfortunately, um, if the uh, Invest in America bill uses up all of the reconciliation money, uh, basically that is uh, the technical budget process for how you pass um, the, the budget um, authority. They won't have money to offset what the CBO just released last week. And the CBO came out with its uh, financial forecast for the highway and transit truck fund. Over the next 10 years, the highway and transit truck fund combined will be short uh, almost $200 billion. Now, when I was a staffer on the Hill not that long ago, the entire five year um, safety loop bill, uh, Don, Don Young wanted $250 billion. We will be short nearly that amount uh, over the next 10 years for transportation funding based off current expenditures. Um, what it means on the highway side, we are short $140 billion over the next 10 years. And on the transit side, we're short uh, almost $55 billion. So to pass a bill through Congress um, because of budget point of order, you have to overcome that. And that's why I think if we are going to see an infrastructure bill, one of two things is going to, to have to happen. First, we'll, there, Congress will have to agree on a new budget bill. Uh, so in order to pass uh, appropriations bills every year, you're technically supposed to pass a budget. Um, they had a budget agreement through this current fiscal year, which will expire September 30th. Again, the the um, the stimulus bill is going to eat up all of that budget authority. So they'll have to pass a new budget bill for FY 22, 23, something like that. If they're unable to do that, the only way you are able to avoid the budget point of order would to be to raise revenue to offset the expenditures meaning that transportation would likely fall under the umbrella of some sort of climate bill with some sort of taxing mechanism, whether it's the carbon tax, whether it's increase in the fuel taxes, whatever it might be, uh, that would be the mechanic that the Senate would have to use to overcome the point of order. So I'm not very uh, optimistic about a reauthorization bill at least in calendar year uh, 2021. Uh, again, the Biden administration has to get all of the cabinet members established. Then they have to kind of work on coordinating federal policy. And if transportation is part of a bigger uh, piece that would take place under, on, under say, a climate uh, type of thing, then it will be a much larger bill. This is sort of the path the House took last year when they looked at their HR, I think it was HR 3, when transportation was just one piece of the $3 trillion bill that they wanted to take. Uh, so at least when it comes to transportation, I, I think that's sort of what we're looking at. We're looking at 
maybe putting some of those pieces of the puzzle together this year, doing some sort of extension, um, and then looking at possibly a reauthorization bill heading in uh, to uh, calendar year uh, 22. Now, things can rapidly change if the uh, COVID bill were to downsize a little bit and they had extra budget authority, that could help spur through a reauthorization bill. But as it kind of looks today, that uh, sort of is, is how it's uh, kind of stands. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too much information for you all at once, and hopefully it didn't drown you uh, in, into details. But um, at this point, I guess I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mickey? Are there any hands raised, Camp? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, not at this time. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Mr. Chair, this is Ron. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. Um, Mickey, thank you. That's really helpful, I guess. Um, what do you see? At, obviously, one of the big barriers to getting a full reauthorization going is how you pay for the darn thing. And yeah. You know what do you what do you hear in what are the prospects of getting to any kind of agreement that can make it through Congress on how to pay for transportation infrastructure? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, if if the administration goes down the path of tying transportation to climate action, I think there's about a zero percent chance of a transportation reauthorization anytime soon. If they go down the traditional path where they just focus on transportation, uh, in the past, Republicans have allowed deficit spending on infrastructure because um, it's good for their state and it's just the thing they don't want to fall on their sword for. Uh, so I think that will be the first piece. The other piece that looks like it could reemerge in Congress would be potentially bringing back earmarks. And if that happens, that is potentially uh, what they call greasing the wheel, right? It, it goes back to the old days where members were able to say, hey, I got this X project, and it would offset the pain that would take for the vote itself. If that were to officially come back, and lots of rumors about whether that will or won't come back, if that were to come back, um, that could potentially help a bill like transportation where people, you talk to politicians, they all say that they support it, but then when it comes down to the details, they have a hard time agreeing on how to um, actually make it work. Mm -hmm. Does that help answer the question, Ron? Yeah, no, it, it really does. Um, and I think one of the things that'll be interesting to keep an eye on is, you know, the, the reauthorization framework that came out of, um, uh, out of the Senate uh, on a bipartisan basis had some increased language around sort of tying transportation infrastructure and programs to dealing with climate and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it, it did. Um, on the EPW side, it, it absolutely did. Uh, some of the other committees didn't quite uh, get through their processes, but Ron is right. Uh, on, the, on the Environment and Public Works Committee, um, it was surprising how far Republican chairman went with some of uh, the the more progressive ideas. Now it wasn't anywhere near where the House was, but it, it was what I would call uh, an evolution of where some of the Senate Republicans. Were. And it it does does look like um, Art Griffith has his hand up, Mr. Chair. Okay, Art, go ahead as soon as Cam and you too. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Art, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks. Um, I've always gotten confused about rural or not. I mean, obviously there's parts of Douglas County and other counties that are rural, but I thought that I've um, been misunderstood, but maybe you could clarify. Is the total county population have to be less than 200,000 for it to qualify in the infra grant for rural 
that's a pretty detailed question, but um, where do you get uh, our, clarity on that? Yeah, excellent question. I would actually have to look that up. I know there are boundary lines inside of counties, um, and I know TMA boundary lines may qualify as some of that. So let me um, actually work with that, and maybe I can communicate through Ron uh, to you to, to help clarify how, how that works. Thank you. Good question, Art. Um, are there any other hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, uh, not at this time. Okay. Thank you, Mickey, for the presentation. I'm sure we'll be looking forward to see what actually comes out of the bills when they come through. Well, thank you for allowing me to participate. Y'all have a great afternoon. And thank you. At this point, we'll move on to uh, our final informational briefing. It's a draft update of the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, uh, the Regional Roadway System, and the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit typologies. Jacob, it sounds like you have quite a presentation here. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog. Um, let me get my presentation set up here. Okay, Mr. Chair, can you hear me and see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So, yeah, I'll try and make this uh, relatively efficient given the late hour of the day, but did want to cover several important topics with you all. Um, did want to talk about kind of where we stand on the 2050 uh, RTP document uh, that we did release uh, last last week. It's been out about a week um, for public review. Um, and then we did want to talk a little bit about the regional roadway system. And then we wanted to link that to the work that we're doing right now on the Complete Streets Toolkit and specifically on something we call street typologies, uh, which I will explain in the presentation. So starting with the draft 2050 RTP document, uh, we did release it for public and stakeholder review on Friday, February 12th. Um, that kicks off our 30-day public comment period, which will culminate in a public hearing in front of the Dr. Cog board uh, on March 17th. Uh, we have a really excellent engagement site um, that our public engagement specialist, Lisa, uh, put together. Um, has a lot of different ways to kind of engage with this plan and interact with this plan. You can look at the entire plan. You can look at it by chapter. There's an interactive um, projects map. Um, that you can just click on um, particular projects that you might be interested in. Um, there's other things kind of on built into that site in terms of how to engage with the plan. And during this 30-day public comment period, we are kind of doing the virtual roadshow, uh, going around the region, uh, talking to the county transportation forums, uh, several municipal transportation committees or transportation advisory boards. Uh, we will have a couple of virtual um, public meetings uh, where people can come to us and engage this as they feel appropriate and other things that we're planning. So really the message here is that hopefully you saw our announcement from us, but the plan is out there. We very much want people to take a look at it, um, engage with it. Um, as you've heard me say previously, we structured this plan to be very visually engaging, um, communicate priorities, um, get people interested in, you know, what can be an es esoteric topic of a 30 year long range plan, um, but it really does set the framework for investment in multimodal transportation and we definitely want the eyes of the region on it. I um, want to talk a little bit about something called the regional roadway system. I know many of you know what this is. Uh, for some of you, this might be new. Um, I do want to give credit to our distinguished chair of TAC who asked us to bring this as an informational item um, and kind of talk to you about what this is a little bit and how it relates to the regional transportation plan. So the map you see on the left is the map that's actually in the document in the draft 2050 plan showing the regional roadway system. Um, but I do wanna take a moment just to kind of explain what it is and what it's not. So uh, big thing to understand, as it says here, it's our planning network of major roadways. So the first thing to understand is that it's not project-based. It's a network of roadways and the projects in the plan are projects on that network, but the regional roadway system itself is not a collection of projects. It's really that network of major roadways in this region. In saying that, it's both primarily our existing network, but it's also our future network. There are a few kind of lines on that map um, that don't exist just yet. It includes kind of three sort of big picture functional classifications, uh, limited access facilities, meaning interstates and freeways, 
something called major regional arterials, and then most of the roadways on the regional roadway system are principal arterials. Okay, that's interesting. What does that all mean? What do we use it for? Um, we use it for a couple things. We use it for air quality conformity, so that's important. We use it as an eligibility criteria for projects that are um, either in um, the regional transportation plan, in this case, the 2050 RTP, um, but it's also used as eligibility uh, for projects in the transportation improvement program. And then we also use it to do some data summaries because it is kind of our official kind of planning network. Uh, we use it for data summaries for the RTP as well. We revise the regional roadway system during major RTP updates as we've been going through for the 2050 plan. We don't revise it during cycle amendments or kind of, you know, once a year, maybe twice a year, uh, typical cycle amendments to the plan. The idea here is that when we start a major update to the RTP, as we did for 2050, a year and a half, almost two years ago, this is one of the first things we do um, is we solicit changes, uh, which could be additions or deletions or changes in classification uh, to the regional roadway network. And then we kind of fix that network for the life of the plan. Um, that's what the plan is based on and that's what the TIPs implementing the plan are based on. And then four years later, when we start a major plan update again, um, then again, we change the regional roadway system. So speaking of changes to the system, um, again, you know, sort of put your regional hat on. Again, we're talking about principal arterials, major regional arterials, and limited access facilities. These roadways are really sort of our most major roadways in this region, state highways um, and some non-state highways, um, really longer distance travel, uh, connectivity to regional facilities. Uh, we also look at length and spacing of proposed additions uh, to the regional roadway system. The map that you're seeing on this slide is a map of changes um, that were requested of Dr. Cog uh, for the 2050 RTP for the regional roadway system. So it's the roadways in blue um, and there's one in orange. Um, these are changes either uh, primarily additions uh, to the regional roadway system that were requested um, by local governments at the beginning of the plan process. Um, and then I added a note here, this is not in your packet. Um, it did come to our attention from the State Highway 7 Coalition. They did have a request to change the functional classification of State Highway 7. It's obviously already on the network. Currently it's on the network as a principal arterial. They had asked that the change be to um, major regional arterial. Uh, we will honor that request, um, but inadvertently didn't include it um, in the plan or on this map, and we will do that. Uh, for the final version of the plan for adoption. The other thing I'd note about this is the functional classifications that I've explained here, the three functional classifications, principal arterial, major regional arterial, um, and limited access facilities, those are a Dr. Cog classification and they may be different um, than local governments and that's okay. Again, this is a planning network for Dr. Cog, um, so it's kind of a simplified, um, a simplified categorization in terms of classification for us to use. It's not meant to exactly match you know, our 56 local governments in terms of your individual roadway classifications. So um, from there, let me springboard into a conversation about our complete streets toolkit and our complete streets typologies. Really the link between these two is the regional roadway system obviously shows a geography and a simplified classification of where these facilities are, but it doesn't really talk about what happens on those roadways knowing it's a principal arterial or even knowing it's a major regional arterial doesn't necessarily say a lot about what that roadway should look like, how it should function. If I'm a local government and I have a TIP project on that roadway, what does it look like? What's the local context of land use? Um, how is a principal arterial different in central Denver than it is in a suburban community, et cetera, et cetera. So the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit and the part we're gonna talk about today is really meant in part to help fill in some of those gaps, to bring a little bit of framework and structure and definition to um, these roadways to really help guide investment priorities. So in the big picture, the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit, um, as it says, is to help local governments plan, design, and implement complete streets um, across our region, um, and also to ensure multimodal elements are incorporated into uh, complete street transportation projects. Uh, I'm not going to read all these project goals, but really, again, it's um, like some of the other recent work we've done around Regional Vision Zero, active transportation, freight, um, some of our other recent plans. Really, it's meant to provide data, information, toolkits, resources, strategies, other things to help local governments implement, um, in this case, complete streets. Um, but I've highlighted here um, one of the specific goals of the Complete Streets Toolkit project is to develop a multimodal street design typology, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. 
So again, I kind of, you know, sort of talked about this already, but the typologies that we're going to talk about are included in the draft 2050 document to assist with defining investment priorities and strategies. This work is so important that even though the overall Complete Streets Toolkit project is ongoing, the typologies is a really critical piece of the draft 2050 plan in terms of, again, setting that framework that the plan does for investment priorities. And we've included the draft typologies in chapter two of the draft 2050 RTP. So what is a street typology? At its core, it's a, it's a collection of common street designs. Each prioritizes users and various elements based on the context and character um, of a particular street. It's based on roadway function, modal priorities, and the built environment. So again, you know, those things I rattled off a couple of slides ago about, you know, what is the local context? What are the land uses around the street? What is the street, you know, function as in the middle of a big city versus a suburban location? It's meant to take all of those into account. It doesn't replace functional classification. So same as the regional roadway system, it's not meant uh, to do, you know, to replace or supersede local government functional classifications, but it does draw a relationship between functional classification and typology. And it can change along segments of a roadway. You know, think of a long roadway like Colfax or um, US 287, you know, some of our longer roads, they go through different types of, of neighborhoods, different types of land uses along their routes. And then importantly, the typologies are meant to be aspirational, to reflect not just what's there today, but what is the long-term vision? What's the long-term potential uh, for these streets over time? You know, we know that our communities are constantly changing. We know over the next 30 years that uh, by 2050, a particular street or particular roadway may function and, and look and operate very differently than it does today. And that aspirational component is a big part of these street typologies. So I talked about functional classification. This gives you a sense of a little bit of that relationship between a functional classification and the typologies. Again, one doesn't replace the other. Um, they work together to help us better understand uh, what these streets are and how they should operate and how they should be designed. Um, so I kind of said these things, um, you know, one street type could apply to multiple functional classifications. I think you see that in the matrix here. So what is the function of a regional uh, street typology? Um, as I've said, it informs Dr. Cog project prioritization. We want to give us, we want to give you a really better sense of, you know, when it comes tip time, you know, I'm a local government, I've got a project on one of these streets, really to provide some framework. What, sh what should that project look like? Uh, what should the design look like? How should it help um, support the function and the evolution of that particular street in that particular location? Um, some of these other things, encouraging cross-jurisdictional collaboration. Again, many of these streets, you know, pick your favorite street, whether it is Colfax or Federal, 287, Hamden, you know, they cross multiple jurisdictions and we want jurisdictions to work together. Um, also incentivizing complete street planning and design, and again, providing resources to local governments. So what do the street typologies include? I'm not going to read off all of these things, but really to um, as you can as you can read and see, really to give that sort of um, you know design schematic, that design framework, really help um, understand you know what that should look like for a particular street in a particular context. So if we know that we have an urban arterial, you know really dense sort of built up land uses, you know it, it may be a, a, a through street, it may even be a state highway, but it's really functioning as that sort of urban main street. Um, you know, or suburban location or rural location. Um, again, it's really marrying sort of the multimodal transportation function with the surrounding land use and context and community character of where those streets are. Um, the street typologies include high level design treatment guidance for all the things that you see there. Um, again, all of the multimodal elements of what it takes uh, to make a complete street um, that accommodates multiple modes of travel at once. Um, in terms of street typologies development, and I think many of you have actually been involved um, in this work. Uh, we've gone out to local governments. We have our steering committee. Uh, we've done some workshops around the region. Um, so this gives you a sense of, you know, how we've kind of stepped through sort of developing, uh, proposing and developing these, these draft street typologies. So this is a list of those draft typologies. I'm not going to go through every single one of these, uh, but again, given the diversity of our communities, the diversity of streets within our region, um, how they operate, how they function, 
the context of those streets. Uh, we wanted to come up with a list that was not too many, but enough to sort of capture that diversity, but also provide some meaningful um, direction and uh, framework uh, for, again, the aspirational vision of what these streets could look like over time throughout our region. And then this map um, kind of gives you a sense of those street typologies. The larger map uh, was included in your packet. Um, and again, this is the map that's included in chapter two of the draft 2050 RTP. And with that, um, I know I breezed through a lot pretty quickly, but wanted to give you that overview and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand and uh, then Kim will call on you. Kim? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm gonna give it a second just to be safe, but currently I am not seeing any hands raised at this time. Jacob, the final comments are due March 17th? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any hands raised, then uh, we will move on to our next item, uh, member comments and uh, other items. And Carson, do you have an update on um, AMP? And Cam, you may need to unmute Carson on that. He is unmuted and ready to go. Okay, Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was frantically pressing that mute button, hoping it would turn <laughs> at some point. Um, yeah, I do. I just have a short update. The AMP working group met earlier this month and received a kind of focused update on the shared mobility subcommittee group. Uh, that included updates from CDOT on their Connected Colorado project and from RTD on their Accelerating Innovative Mobility project as a part of their FDA AIM grant from last year. We also received an informational briefing from HNTB about BRT and multi-jurisdictional environments. Um, that's all the updates I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Carson. Are there any other members that have comments? Please raise your hand. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do see a hand has been raised by uh, Alex Hyde-Wright. So Alex, you've been unmuted and uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Alex Hyder with Boulder County. I just wanted to thank Dr. Cog for making the change uh, or for bringing forward the change in status for State Highway 7 uh, to a major regional arterial. Uh, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, and then um, I, I noticed David still on the line. Uh, David Kretzinger, do you, I understand this is your last meeting. Do you have any comments or items, David? And uh, Cam, if you'll unmuting. Uh, he is unmuted, Mr. Chair. Yeah. David? Um, thanks to the TAC for uh, all the great work. Um, I will look forward to seeing you all in a different uh, role um, as I uh, move to join the city of Denver. Um, I don't have any further comments on any of the items on today's agenda. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, if there's no other hands, are there any other hands raised, Cam? Uh, no, Mr. Ch no, Mr. Chair, there are not. Okay. Uh, I would like to remind uh, everyone that we won't have a March meeting, but our next meeting will be April 5th, uh, 2021. And uh, with that, at 3.30, we are adjourned. Thank you.